This week I want to work on a case study and I want to take you through starting to think about how to how to contribute to larger projects. How do I get involved in a bigger project than some of the ones that you've just been starting with? I'm trying to encourage you to slowly ramp up the contributions that you make. And part of this is, you know, experience and gaining confidence and part of it is just learning to not be intimidated by big projects. So how do you, I mean, it's easier said than done. How do you, how do you get over feeling intimidated and like, you know, you don't know what you're doing and, and the code is too complicated. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through fixing a bug or at least researching a fix to a bug inside of Visual Studio Code. I thought I would begin with this because this is a nice project in a number of ways. So Visual Studio Code, I have the uh, survey data from Stack Overflow does a survey of its developers quite often. And this was the 2018 data. I couldn't quickly find the 2020 data with the same statistic, but uh, VS Code is one of, if not the most popular coding editor right now. Um, I know for many of my students, that's what people are using. It's a, it's a, great, it's a great piece of software. I use it and really enjoy it. And I thought it would be good for us to look at, uh, you know, fixing a bug in it because it's a pretty significant piece of code. So let me just talk about what Visual Studio Code is. So Visual Studio Code, let me make this a little smaller, started in 2015 and there are, uh, on the GitHub page, let's have a look here, there are like almost 1300 contributors. So you got lots of people contributing to this project. Fairly big project. How big of a project? Well, about 1.5 million lines of code and um, mostly written in TypeScript, JavaScript, et cetera. And um, I'm on a site here called um, Black Duck Open Hub and they do statistics for open source projects and it's kind of neat to see it. And so they say, you know, their estimates are that if you were to start rewriting this project today, it would take one person 421 years of effort to rewrite it. Like it's a huge program. Um, okay, what else can we say about it? Well, it's built on a whole bunch of other projects. So when you're thinking about what Visual Studio Code actually is, the funny thing is it's really just a big web page and it's like a great big website. And so powering all of Visual Studio code is this other thing called Electron. So Electron allows you to write HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and then bundle that up with a bunch of APIs that let you do cross-platform desktop applications. So there's all kinds of people who use this because it's amazing to be able to write your, your GUI for a desktop application once write it in HTML and CSS, and then be able to deploy it on Mac, Linux, Windows, and it works everywhere. So Electron is another huge project. So if you look at Electron, Electron has a thousand contributors. It's mostly written in C++, mostly C++ and TypeScript. And uh, it's about 133,000 lines of code but it's also built on top of a browser engine. So it's built on top of Chromium. Chromium is the open source portion of uh, Chrome, and it's used by lots of different projects. Microsoft Edge uses it, Google uses it, Brave uses it. Lots and lots of different projects use this base to render their web, their web content. Chromium is about 25 million lines of C++, so a huge program. So Electron bundles together Chromium, but it also bundles up Node. So you have Node.js and a browser kind of all bundled into one thing. And Node is uh, roughly 6 million lines of C++ and JavaScript. So you've got all this as a base on top of which that's how they ship uh, VS Code. But then VS Code is written in TypeScript. 
So TypeScript itself is a huge project. Like if you go and look at the TypeScript project, there are 4,500 4, open issues on the TypeScript repo, 533 contributors. So TypeScript is an open source project. Like you could go in and you could contribute to that. VS Code is also split up into a lot of other components. So for example, the editor component is separate from Visual Studio Code. It's called the Monaco editor. So if you ever wanted to uh, include a, just an editor inside of a web application, you can use Monaco and Monaco, this is what it looks like. So it's not Visual Studio Code, it's just the part where you type and the line numbers and like all of these features here. So Visual Studio Code takes the Monaco editor and builds all this other stuff around it, like file, um, being able to navigate through your files, being able to install extensions, uh, saving, all that kind of stuff is what Visual Studio Code offers. But then this Monaco component is here and you can see that there are 67 contributors that work on this. It's mostly written in JavaScript and HTML. And you can see that they have 390 open issues. So then there's a lot of other components inside of VS Code that are separated out. So another example is Xterm. Xterm is the terminal. So, you know, when you have a terminal in VS Code, it's it's this thing. So Xterm is another open source project, 196 contributors, mostly written in TypeScript. They've got 183 open, open issues. And um, this allows you to really easily put a terminal into a web page. And so because Visual Studio Code is basically a web page, when they want to put a terminal into Visual Studio Code, they use this project. So you have just a ton of different, uh, you have a ton of different uh, projects that are combined together to make Visual Studio Code. I mean, we could go even further. Like if I were to go to VS Code and look at their package.json file, they have all kinds of like, this whole screen is different dependencies, node modules. And then each one of these node modules also includes other node modules. So there's like over a thousand node modules that are all in there. Those are other open source projects that are part of this. So you think about something like VS Code. VS Code is like 1.5 million lines of code, but then it's built on this base and underneath it are all of these other pieces of the platform all this other technology that's involved in making this work. So when you're thinking about contributing to a project like this, there's all sorts of layers in the stack that you could contribute to. We haven't even talked about extensions. Like you could work on Visual Code, uh, Visual Studio Code extensions, and there's a million of them. So it's a huge, huge ecosystem. Okay, so let's dig into this. So I want to get involved in Visual Studio Code, or Visual Studio Code rather. I want to contribute to it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow through their contributing guide, and then I have a bug that I want to fix, and I'll show you that in a minute. So how do you get started with this code? So most big projects like VS Code are going to have a readme file, but they're usually going to split their readme file and their con contribution information into two different documents. So usually there is a contributing.md guide. So contributing.md takes you through all the different ways that you can contribute to the project. And you know, writing code is not necessarily the most important thing you can do in an open source project. Um, you, that might sound like a funny thing, but they need people to f report issues. They need people to look at existing issues and help them figure out what to prioritize, what's important, what should they do, what shouldn't they do. They have information in here on how to write a good bug report. So if something isn't working, how do you tell them about it? On and on and on it goes. And then very, very uh, all the way at the bottom, it says contributing fixes. If you're interested in writing code to fix an issue, please see the how to contribute guide in the wiki. So then we have another document over here, the how to contribute guide, taking us through what we have to do in order to get started. And they have some guides here. Like if you want to get started working on bugs, you can look for bu bugs that are labeled help wanted or um, issues that are labeled good first issues if you want to get started working on this. So then we get into the prerequisites for building this thing. Okay, when you're going to set up something the size of visualstudio.code, what you're going to find is you're going to have to set up a lot of different tools. And this is a major 
uh, hurdle for people because I think that you're used to working on small software where all you need is you need to install one thing and you open it up in that tool and everything works. But when you work on big pieces of software, you're going to need all kinds of tools. So if you take a quick look at what we need here, we're going to have to have Git. We're going to have to have Node. But I want you to notice something. Many, many of big projects are going to limit you to a specific version of something. So here they say you have to be using Node.js, something between version 10 and version 12. So if you're using 13, 14 or something newer, it's not going to work. If you're using 9, it's not going to work. So when you're looking at these environment setup guides, pay close attention to these versions and don't say to yourself, yeah, I'm just going to ignore that because if you ignore it, things are going to break. We need to have Yarn. If you haven't heard of Yarn before, Yarn is a, it's sort of a sister project to NPM. So it allows you to um, install node packages from the NPM registry, but it, it's just a different client. Instead of using NPM on the command line, you use Yarn. So we need to install Yarn. They have an installation guide on how to get Yarn installed. You need to have Python. Now this is going to seem weird because we're building something in TypeScript, but we need Python and this is very common. So typically what you're going to have is you're going to have build requirements that are going to use various scripting languages. So you might be building a C++ project, but it has its build system, part of it's written in Python or you know, you have all these scripting languages that get incorporated into it. So again, it says you have to have version 2.7, version 3 is not supported. So if you have the latest and greatest version of Python, it's not going to work with this tool chain. You need to have a C++ compiler. So like you got to have Node, Python, and C++ in order to work on this code. Fascinating, right? So the code is partly done in binary, partly done in scripting languages, partly done in web programming languages. It's a whole mix of things. So then it goes into specifics for each environment. So if you're on Windows, this is what you have to do here. You're going to have to install um, the Visual Studio 2017 Community Edition, or it gives you different ideas for how to do this. You'll have to restart your computer. You'll have to be careful for certain issues, etc. If you're on Mac, you're going to have to install Xcode, which is going to give us GCC, which will be our compiler. If you're on Linux, you're going to need to install all of these dependencies. You need GCC, package config, and make in order to run these things. And so it gives you some idea of how to do this on your, uh, on your machine. So let me just check my versions of everything to see what I have here. And then we'll move forward with this. So I've got a terminal here. And let's check and just make sure that I'm in good shape. So Git, I know that I have, so I'm good. Node, I have version 13 right now. So that's not going to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use, I think I've mentioned to you before, I'm going to use NVM. NVM is the Node version manager. And <clears throat> what it'll let me do is it'll let me change versions I won't go through this, I'll just use it. So I'm gonna say NVM use uh, 12. And what it'll do is it'll switch to version 12 of Node. And that's great. So now for working on this, I have that. I'm gonna check to see if I have Yarn. I do have Yarn already installed on this machine, so I'm not gonna bother doing the installation of that, but you would need to check and make sure. Uh, I have Python. Yes, I have Python 2.7, which is great. Do I have a, a C compiler? It's, I think it's just paused waiting for me. Uh, what do we have here? Yes, I do. So I've got my tool chain set up on this machine. So because I've done lots of development, I have all of these tools set up. But if you don't have one of these things set up, then you're going to need to go and work through getting this on your machine. Okay, so the next thing we need to do, if we're going to work on this, we need to um, fork it. So we fork the repo. I actually already have a fork of it here. So I'm going to just go to my fork. This is my version of the uh, of this, and you can see the last time that I worked on this, 
uh, 16,000 commits behind. <laughs> so it moves very, very fast. There's a lot of people, uh, there's a lot of people working on this. Okay, so let's do the following. Let's grab, um, I'm going to clone, clone this. So get clone VS code into this and this will take a minute, so I'll just pause it so you don't have to wait through this. Okay, so that's finished. And we go into VS Code. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do here is, just before I, I complete, I'm going to go to the upstream repo and I'm gonna add a remote for the upstream repo as well. So I'm gonna grab the URL for the upstream repo, Microsoft's, and I'm gonna say git remote add upstream and I'm going to git pull upstream master so that I can get my local master to be updated to whatever is whatever has changed. All those 16,000 commits that it says that I didn't have, I want to download them so that when I'm working on the code right now, I'm working on the code, the latest version of the code that uh, Microsoft's been working on. So it's downloading a ton of stuff here. You can see it doing a fast forward merge. It just fast forwarded all of these changes, like hundreds and hundreds of files have been changed since the last time that I looked at this. Okay, so we are ready to go in terms of downloading all of the code and we have it all on our machine. So what's the next step? So it says that I need to install and build all of the dependencies with Yarn. Okay, so it says go into VS Code and run Yarn. So if we do this, we go in here, we run Yarn. And Yarn is going to download and install packages, but it will also run various build steps. So some of this will be the compiler working um, to compile various pieces of C++. Some of it will be just downloading or fetching uh, node modules that it has to has to work on. And you can see over here, it's going through 41,426 uh, different dependencies that it needs to set up. So there's tons and tons of stuff that has to get set up. Yarn's pretty fast. So we'll let it do it. I'll let it do its thing. I'll just pause this so you don't have to wait. Okay, so that finished and it took like six minutes to complete on my machine. And things basically looked like they work. It just installed and set up lots of things, but I did have a few of the binary packages fail. So like, take a look at this. I've got tons and tons and tons of um, C++ error messages being spit out here. It's trying to compile something and like it can't do it. However, when you're, when you're building some of these projects, like down here, it says, uh, I noticed this message here, and it says that this module is optional. You can, you can safely ignore this error. So it's not, it's not good that this has failed, but oftentimes, especially in node projects, they'll have uh, optional binary dependencies, which can be faster, but if they don't, if for some reason they can't build, then it'll fall back to a JavaScript version. Um, so in this case, that's probably what's gonna happen here. Um, so I now have all of the dependencies installed and I'm ready to move on to the next steps. So they have some good troubleshooting docs and what you can see here is you can see, you know, various people have hit problems trying to build this and they've tried to document it. So when you're working on an open source project, if you run into some weird build issue, A, you should go and look at the docs and see if it's there, but B, you should consider filing a bug because maybe what needs to happen is somebody needs to put a note in the documentation that says, if you have this version and you're in, on Windows and this and that, then do these steps. Okay, then they have information about development containers. Um, I'm not gonna do this because I've already got all the local dependencies installed. So then we get into building and run. Okay, so if you wanna understand how it works or you wanna debug an issue, then you have to build and run it locally. So that's what we're doing right here. So we need to get down to the build. So it says you can go into VS Code and you can start the build task with this command, this command here. Um, it will start an incremental builder and it'll do an initial full build display messages, and then it'll say it has finished compilation when it's done. 
and the builder will then watch for file changes. So this is gonna rebuild every time something changes, which is good. So we can do fast iterative coding. It'll stay running in the background, even if you close VS Code, and you can resume it by starting the build task again, or you can kill it with doing this. Um, okay, this is interesting. You can also run the build in the terminal with this command here and pressing control C will leave it running in the background, pressing control D will kill it permanently. Okay, so let's do this. I wanna run this inside the terminal. So I'm gonna say yarn watch D. So here it is compiling for the first time all of the different extensions and you can see it's starting the compilation and you can see that it's watching all the different extensions that are in here and according to this what I'm looking for is I'm looking for it to say that it has finished running the compilation step. Okay while that's happening let's see what else we can see. So errors and warnings will show in the console um, to run it. To test the changes, you uh, launch a development version of VS Code. Okay, and so you can do that in Mac and Linux by doing this, and in Windows by doing this. So that's interesting. Okay, so one of the things that I really respect about what my uh, VS Code does, uh, so this is in scripts, the scripts directory. If we go over to VS Code, so Microsoft is building a product that needs to work on Linux, Mac, uh, and on Windows, obviously. So in their scripts directory, they have different versions of their scripts for different operating systems. So if I'm on a, if I'm on a Unix machine, then I'm probably going to want to run a shell script like a .sh file. Um, however, if I am on a Windows machine, I probably want to run a batch file. And so they've, they've done something really nice here, which is a good example for other people to say, like, we're going to have both, both ways available. Depending on which operating system you're on, we're going to support development on all of, these different, uh, all of these different systems. And so when you're working on an open source project, this is a good model to follow. Try and provide cross-platform scripts or cross-platform ways of building the code, developing the code. Because if you have to have a Mac to develop the code, it means that Windows people can't work on the code. If you have to have a Windows machine to work on the code, then people on Linux can't help you. So you've, you know, there's, there's an investment here, but if you're willing to do it, it's a good move. Okay, so I noticed that my uh, compilation has finished. So in theory, this is now compiled and it's running and it's ready to go. Okay, so it says, if you wanna run this, then you need to run this. So I need another terminal. So I'm gonna open up another terminal and uh, in this other terminal, I'm going to run the code.sh uh, code script. My machine is lagging as I do 7,000 things on it. Give me a second here. Okay, so we go to... And let's try running this scripts and code.sh. So it looks like it's still doing uh, some more building here. So it's downloading FFmpeg, which is for doing uh, media transcoding. It's downloading Electron, uh, a binary of a binary version of Electron that will work on Mac. So Darwin is for Mac. So I'm getting 64-bit Electron that's being downloaded. This is really slick. So when I run this, it automatically downloads the the particular versions of various binaries that it needs in order to to use this. So this is another common setup you're going to run into where you have to have, on the one side, I have a terminal uh, which has got my code compilation happening. And 
on the other side, I have, um, on the other side, I've got like, I'm running the, the project. So this thing has built and run. And so now I have this right here. So this is um, the built version of Visual Studio Code as opposed to the one that I usually use. And it's working, so this is really cool. Okay, so now let's take a look at what else. I'm gonna move some of these terminals around. What else do we have? So it says debugging. So you can debug this in a number of ways. You can debug it inside Visual Studio Code or you can debug it using the Chrome developer tools. So I'm more familiar with this, so let me run this. So it says run the developer toggle developer tools command from the command palette inside of your uh, instance. So if I go here and I go to the command palette here and I say developer, there it is here, developer toggle developer tools, then I'm gonna end up with the the dev tools here, and this is my web page. So just to prove to you that this is a web page, like look at this, this is a div right here. So this is this is a div, this is a div, and you know I've got CSS and I've got HTML. This is just an HTML web page. And this is this is very cool. So um, we've we've now got everything we 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 need to be able to fix this bug. So I've got my build over here is working. I've got the code right here. I've got the I've got the debugger running, and I also have somewhere back here. I've lost it now. Uh, this is where I'm running the code. So what you're seeing here are messages that are being dumped out to the console. Um, so this app, when it's when it's logging things, it's logging things over here, whatever it's showing. Okay, so this is a good time for me to tell you about the bug that I want to try and fix. So. I have noticed in Visual Studio Code that something that I use in browsers doesn't work in Visual Studio Code and it really bugs me. So when you're in a browser, if you do, if you hold down the control key and hit plus or on a Mac, it's the command key. So if I do command plus, this gets bigger. You can see up here, it says it's 120%. And if it says here, notice it says, do, I, I can't point to it, but it says reset the zoom level with command zero. So if I do command minus, it goes down. If I do command plus, it goes up. And if I do command zero, it goes to what the normal zoom level is. So command plus or control plus, control minus, and control zero to go back to, 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 go back to the one that you want. Okay, so let me show you this inside Visual Studio Code. Let me get rid of the debugger here. Here's Visual Studio Code. Let me open up a file. Um, say git ignore. Okay, so here's this. Let's say I want to make this bigger. So I do command plus, it gets bigger. Command minus, it gets smaller. Command plus, plus. If I do command zero, nothing happens. It's broken. Command minus, command minus, command plus, command plus, command zero, nothing. It doesn't do anything. So the bug that I wanna try and figure out is why when I do command zero, does this thing not, not do what I want? Okay, so the problem that we have right now is we, we know that somewhere inside these 1.5 million lines of code, there is there's something that is either not working correctly or preventing this, or it was never programmed to do it. But we got to think about how we're going to, how we're going to find this. So we, we have a problem here now. We have to, we have to sort out where this, where this thing lives, where this code lives. So I wanted to show you some, some ways of navigating around in the code. So the first way of doing this, which I think you're probably already going to be familiar with, is you can do searches inside of the um, inside of GitHub. So if I'm in GitHub and I wanted to do a search for, like, let's say I want to do a search for control CTRL, and I search in this repository for CTRL, then I get what do I get? I get inside of code there's 219 matches so i can do i can search in commits issues wikis 
right? So you have to pick what you're searching within. I wanna search within code. There's 219 of these. Of these, 200 are in TypeScript, some are in text, some are in JSON. So there's a whole bunch of these things. So you can see that they have, like it looks like there's key bindings in here, which is interesting. So they have like electron key bindings um, for different, so like here's the US, let's take a look at this for example. So it has all various keys. So it has control, key, and A, and it has combinations. So this is interesting. So like if we looked for CTRL plus, um, if I look for CTRL plus plus, that doesn't work. If I look for CTRL plus the word plus, that doesn't work. Um, so we have to figure out, We, it's not clear to me yet, how to look for what I want to look for. But we do see that there is a bunch of stuff in like key bindings. So we probably want to dig around for this. And right now when you're doing a search like this, you're just looking around for things that you could you could look for. Okay, now let me show you another way to do these searches. I'm gonna um, open up another terminal here and I'll show you another uh, searching technique. So we've been doing, when you do this search, uh, inside Visual Studio Code. The downside of this is you have to have network. So you have to be able to get on the web and you have to be able to, um, you have to be able to search, you know, search with a, with, a, with a web connection. But if you're just working locally and all you have is uh, the GitHub repo and you have everything on your machine, you really don't need a web browser to be able to get to it because all of the code still lives on this machine. So let's go over to VS Code. And let me talk to you about a command that we can use to do searches. So you've probably learned grep in other courses that you've looked at. And I wanna tell you about another version of it called git grep. So when you want to search inside of the git repository for pieces of text, you can do git grep and then whatever you wanna search for. So let's say git grep control. So if I do this, what it's gonna do is it's gonna print out this is this was not a great example because of the number of, here we go, this looks better. You can see here that what it's done is it's printing out the file and then it's printing out um, where it found it, like control is here. So you can see um, you can see all the different places where it has printed this out, okay? And I can scroll up and down through this. And this is good because I start to learn about uh, different things like keyboard events. And so as I'm searching through this, I'm starting to learn more about, you know, the way that, um, the way that this stuff works. Like for example, this is kind of interesting to me. So it's talking about control and command, which is probably related to what I'm interested in because I'm interested in, um, places where you're doing control on, on a Windows machine or command on a, um, command on a, on, a, on, a, on a Mac. Okay, so a couple more things about grep. So you go up and down to go through it, you press Q to get out of it, okay? Now, so if you say get grep like this control, let's try another one. Let's look for CTRL and command together. Get grep com control and command, nothing. Uh, what did I do wrong? Get grep, is it command and control? Nope, get grep control. Uh, what did I see down here? I thought I saw the two of them together, but maybe I'm misremembering. Uh, control and command. Oh, here it is here. So it's the case that is significant. So let's try this again. So let's do this search for CTRL CMD like this. Okay, that gives me back a bunch of things here and I can see them. Now, here's some other things you can do when you're doing grep. So another thing you can do right now, all we have is we have the name of the file and you see how this file name appears many, many times and it's pushing everything to the right. So another thing you can do is you can say, I wanna do this search, but I wanna put the file name in a heading. So in other words, I wanna put the file name at the top and then I wanna put all the searches underneath it so that I can see what's going on here. Some of these lines are really long. So I scroll through and you can see there's lots and lots of places where it happens like key codes TS is an interesting place 
where it's doing a lot of different things. This is this is a file that we probably want to look for. Um, so let's let's talk about what else can you do with grep. You could say I want to see line numbers. So you can say dash n, and it'll print out and say, okay, this is line number thirty one inside of this file here. This is line number thirty two, and you can see what's going on here. And sometimes when you're when you're searching through, you're not only interested in the line that, that gets gets returned, but you're also interested in having some context. So let's say you wanted to have two lines of context above and two lines of context below. So this says, do a search, put the file names in the heading, give me the line number, and give me two lines of context above and below. And this is what I want to search for here, Control and Command. So I go here and I run this. And what you're seeing now is that I get, I get like it finds this right here, but it gives me two lines above and it gives me two lines below like this. So now when I'm trying to read this, I have a little more context. And if I needed even more context, you could say I want to have like, I want to have six lines of context on either side. So now it gives you much more context here. And you can start to see, all right, this is, this is what I'm seeing when I go looking through this. I'm seeing lots of places where they refer to control and command, control and command. Uh, very interesting, control and command. On and on it goes. Okay, so we're starting to make make some headway here, and when you see a particular, uh, I'm just trying to think. If there's anything else I should show you while we're in here? Oh, I know. Another thing you might want to do is you might want to limit your searches. Let's say you only want to see things in TypeScript files. So you could go over here and you could say, I only want to see star.ts. So this is git grep. Uh, let's get rid of heading just for to change it up. So give me the line number. Give me three lines of context. Look for command and control, but only look for it inside this these paths. So only look for it inside star.ts. So now I'm getting back only star.ts files. You see it has source here. Um, we have source, VS editor. Um, we could limit this even more if we wanted to. So we could say, for example, uh, what else is in here? Source. Look at it. There's so many of these instances. So this is going to be interesting trying to find um, trying to find this. So, all right. So git grep is git grep is your friend uh, for being able to uh, do searches and find. Uh, find pieces of the puzzle of what you're looking for. Okay, so let's try and use git grep and see what we can locate. So my suspicion is, let's do this. I am interested in this command and control. And so we've got key mod command and control. And so this is being defined in this file keyboard event ts. Now, so that's kind of interesting. So when when you're in when you're in um, GitHub, another thing you can do is you can press you can press the T key. So if you press T or go to file here, if I press T, it will let me start typing in a path name. So if I'm interested in seeing a file keyboard event.ts, I could, I could say keyboard event.ts, it comes up here and I could click on this and I could see what's going on in this file. And you can see in here, it looks like this is where they are defining all of the keys. So they have like the control key is defined as 17 and uh, they have all different ones. Okay, now this is interesting. So here's, key zero, key one, key two, key three. So that's interesting. That may be useful. Oh, here's another one, number pad zero. So number pad zero and key zero are both probably interesting to me because that's likely what the user is, um, is pressing along with, um, 
let's see what else we can find. So there's add and subtract. Number pad add. Let's do a search for number pad add because I wonder if that's how they're zooming in. So if I do git grep and I say, um, let's do a search for num pad add. Okay, there's only a few of these. So that doesn't give me a lot to go on. So let's open this up a little bit. Let's get a little more context. Let's get, say, uh, three lines of context. Okay, so here's the first one. The first one is in keyboard event. This is what we're looking at right here, line 96. And then key codes. Okay, so this is all defining them. What else do we have down here? So then we have desktop contribution, electron sandbox, desktop, desktop contribution. So it says register work workbench action, zoom in, Oh, this is very interesting. So it says register zoom in action. So let's try this. So this is in desktop contribution TS. So let's go to that file. Desktop contribution contribution.ts. And I'm looking for numpad uh, add, was it? Here it is right here. So this line of code right here, line 32, says uh, we want to register the zoom in action. Zoom in action is going to be control key and number pad add. And so it's going to zoom in. And then down below it is zoom out. So this is command and control number pad subtract. So this is plus and minus. And then that's going to zoom out. And then there's a third line here, which is zoom reset action. And this is command and control number pad zero. So this right here is very interesting. This is exactly what I would have expected to find that they're doing uh, keyboard actions for zoom in, zoom out and reset. Now, zoom in, zoom out, and reset. Um, let's find them. Zoom in, uh, zoom in action. Okay, so these are all being pulled in here on line 14. Zoom in action is being pulled in from this file right here, VS Workbench Electron Sandbox Actions Window Actions. Okay, so let's do the following. I'm going to open up uh, the debugger and let's try and debug this. Okay, so we go to the command palette, we go to developer tools. <clears throat> and the file that I'm interested, so I'm going to go to sources and I'm interested in opening up this file. Um, Windows, window actions. So what I'm going to do here, you see how it says open a file right here? If I do command P or on Windows, it's control P. So I'm going to do command P and I'm going to go window action. So this is workbench browser actions TS. So I want to do this. And you notice there's two versions. So there's a, there's a JavaScript version and there's a TypeScript version. The, um, the compiler, the TypeScript compiler has compiled the TypeScript to JavaScript. So that's why there's two of them. I want to look at the TypeScript one. So here's TypeScript. And what I want to do is I want to look for zoom in. Is it not here? Uh, maybe I'm in the wrong file. Hmm. Cancel. So am I in the wrong file? Let me see what, let me make sure I'm not. I want to be in this file right here. Let's try again. So I'm going to go to this file and I want to look for zoom in. Okay, here is zoom in action right here. So let me make this bigger. So it says this is a class. So there's zoom in action. And what it's doing is it is setting, so when it runs, it's it's setting the configuration zoom level to plus one of whatever it is. 
and the zoom out action is setting the configuration zoom level to minus one. And then down here, the reset action sets it back to zero. So here's what I'm gonna do. I wanna to prove to myself that I'm in the right place. So I'm gonna set a breakpoint here, here, and here. So now over here in my editor, what that means is if I go over here in my editor and I do command plus, you see what happened? So now I am paused in the debugger. Over here in the debugger, I am paused on line 85. So this is the zoom in action and it's paused right here. So exactly what I expected is happening. So look at what we know over here. You can see over here the call stack. So you can see that it started off down here. This is the first call stack right here where there is a low level keyboard binding service.ts that handles the, um, handles the keyboard event. So because I did, a, I, I did the keyboard event, it starts here and then it gets dispatched and it, it moves its way up through the stack and slowly, 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 it gets converted into an action that needs to be run. So up here, eventually it gets to the fact that it's gonna run some action, some window action, and that's where it's running this object right here. So this is often known, here you've got this kind of command pattern where you take some uh, operation you wanna run inside the UI and you package it up into a class and it has this generic run method. So you can run any of these commands and you know, bind them to keyboard events or to clicks inside of the um, clicks inside of the uh, the UI. Okay, so let's let this run. So I'm going to hit play and let this run, and you'll see that this just got bigger. Okay, now let's test the next one. Let's go over here and do command minus. Command minus. Now I'm inside the zoom out action. You can see that it hit the second breakpoint here. So this is perfect. So now it's going to set it to one less. I'm going to let it play. Okay, let's do the third one. So I'm gonna do command zero, and it doesn't hit my breakpoint. So we have a bug here where the code to do the reset action is here. Like I can see the code, it's right beside all the rest of them, but it's not, it's not being run. So that's a problem. Um, okay, so let's go back and let's figure out Let's get rid of this. Let's get rid of all of this. Okay, so this is, this is, uh, let's go back to this file and let's figure out what's going on. So in this file, you can see that the, re, the zoom reset action is being bound to keep, it's being bound to this right here, like this. So I wonder if something else is using it. So it's possible that they've bound it multiple times by mistake or something. So let's copy this and let's see if we can figure this out. Okay, so let's go back and let's look at, uh, we'll go back to grep and let's do a search here. Okay, so let's do git grep and let's look for uh, this string see what comes back. So the first thing we get back is from the file that we were just in, this desktop contribution.ts. And then we also get back a bunch of other places where the, um, where it's doing tests. You can see it's got tests to make sure that the, the mappings are, are working. Okay. So that's interesting. So that didn't find what I wanted. So something else must be somehow using this. So let's go looking, like if we go looking for this, we're gonna to find too many things, I think. So if we look for uh, this, we're gonna find, like if, if, I, if I run that search, I get back 626 uh, matches. So what if we do a search instead for all the places where key code numpad zero is being used? So git grep, like so. And let's see if we can figure out anything here. 
and let's get some more let's get some more context to this okay so this is in the list widget we've got key codes scan codes key bindings we've got this is the place where we already know that it exists inside the desktop contribution we've got it in the keyboard bindings it's in the test files so what is this list up here this is interesting list widget ts so let's open up another uh list what is it called list widget dot ts and we're looking for numpad zero default keyboard delegation so this looks like it's just a whole i don't know if this is what we want so that's interesting. Okay, so we need to keep we need to keep digging through this. Okay, so one thing I notice about this that's interesting that I had forgotten is there is numpad zero and there's also key zero. So let's let's take a look at this. Um, what if What if we look up um, key code underscore key underscore zero? What if we look up this? Okay, there's only two of them. So let's take a look. Let's let's look at both of these. Uh, show me six lines of context okay so the so there's inside folding.ts if you do um key code uh command and control plus key code zero it's going to run this and there's another one here key 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 code zero and command and control on this okay so let's take a look at these two files so the first file is folding ts. So let me let me pull this up in the um, in the debugger. So folding ts, this one, and I'm looking for um, key zero. Whoops, key zero here. So key zero. Let me make this bigger. So it's it's setting this chord here, which is I assume is like doing multiple keys at the same time. And label alias fold all fold all action so it gets so this is likely where it's being invoked so what if i set a breakpoint there now what's the other one the other one is um side part so let's take a look at side part so i go side part.ts and we look up key zero key zero is here so this is another action and it says if I do these two keys together, it's going to run this over here. So let's set a breakpoint inside here. Okay, so let's. So now we've set a couple of traps. I've got, I've got um, a breakpoint inside this and another breakpoint inside this. So if I do, so I'm going to do command plus. Command plus makes it bigger. We know that works. So this is my first breakpoint. I hit play. So now I'm going to try doing command zero. And right away, I get dropped into this code right here, sidepart.ts. 
So now we know who is stealing my keyboard event. So this is actually kind of interesting because um, I'll show you my keyboard. Uh, let me switch. It's like this. So my keyboard looks like this on my Mac. I have, uh, I don't have a number pad. So I have a zero and that's it. And so when I do command zero, um, when I do command zero, presumably what's happening here is they've, <clears throat> they've done bindings. <sighs> this is fascinating. Um, so I wonder if it's a bug that's very specific to the keyboard that I'm using. Okay, so let's just see what this code does. So if I step through this code, what's it going to do? It's going to get the layout service, get the viewlet service using, uh, okay, so we go down here. It checks to see if the sidebar part is visible. And if so, it says focus it into view. So I think what's going to happen is it's going to focus this control on the left. So I go, I step through here. If the viewlet is visible, then it calls focus. And yeah, did you see it move over here? So this over here now has the focus. This so if I were to move move this, so it didn't have the focus. If I put the focus over here and not here, then what I think it will do. Uh, let me make this a little bit smaller. Let's confirm what I'm thinking. So if I go here and I move this down and I do command zero, it's going to, if I hit play, yeah, it put the focus over onto the left-hand side. So what's happening is it's running on this right here. Okay, so now we've got some really, we've got all the information that we need in order to fix this. Like if I actually wanted to fix this, um, probably what I could do is I could modify, um, let me, let me just, let me close this code, close all, let me, um, file. I want to close this folder and I want to open, I want to open up, let's open up the source code. Um, temp VS code, I'm going to open this up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the code. So I want to change the uh, window actions, not window actions, what do I want to change? I want to change um, desktop contribution.ts. So over here in my editor, I'm going to say um, desktop contributions.ts. I'm going to make this smaller, <laughs> which is going to hit my breakpoint. So bear with me. And I'm going to go down here and where it binds to number pad zero, I'm going to change this to key zero like this. I'm going to save this which should recompile my code. So over here, you can see that the code just recompiled. And now I need to reload. So in the docs, it said something about reloading the window. So over in the contribution docs, there was something about reload. You don't need to stop and restart development. You can just reload the window from the command palette. So that means I can probably go here and say command palette, reload, uh, window. So this is going to reload the window, which should set up the uh, breakpoint here. And let's try it again. So once this loads, I should be able to increase the size, decrease the size, or reset the size. So let's try it. I'm going to do increase hits my breakpoint. I'm going to do command decrease hits my breakpoint. Now let's try increase and then I'm gonna do command zero and it works. So this is now gonna work. And now it's reset it to the proper size. So we have now been able to fix this bug. So this is, um, this is really good. So what I, what I need to do now is I need to file an issue and I need to tell Microsoft about the problem that I've just encountered. And I need to give them all of the, the various uh, pieces of information about what we know. So I'm gonna try, 
I'm gonna try now to, to file this bug. So in VS Code, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna go and we're gonna try filing a new issue. New issue. I'm gonna file a bug report. And this is a very common thing that you're gonna run into when you are filing an issue on a big open source project. They're gonna have templates. And so they say, don't delete this template. They want you to put in as much information as you can um, in order to tell them what's, you know, what's happening. So I need to give them a bunch of information. So the first thing I need to know is I need to figure out what the name of my keyboard is. So it's Mac uh, keyboard wireless mice and keyboard. I have this kind of a keyboard. So it's called a magic keyboard. Magic Keyboard US. So I'm going to, um, let's get an image of this, view this image. So I'm gonna use this when I'm filing my issue because I want to put it into the bug. So I'll, I'll do that right now. So in my issue, one of the things that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show them what my keyboard looks like. So the way you put, um, the way you put an image in, it, you have a couple of ways of doing it. One is um, you can say, I have an image, this is my um, Mac Magic Keyboard, and then in, I'm gonna put it in like so, and if I put, if I preview this, is it gonna let me do it or not? Um, no, I'm gonna have to do it, I'll have to save it to do this. Um, I forget what the right, let me look this up. Uh, GitHub Markdown Images, what the right syntax is. Images, yes. So why did that not work? What did I do wrong? Preview. Hmm. I'm not sure why it's not working, but I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna download this, so I'll just save this. Um, put it in my downloads and save. And then what I'll do is in here, I'll do it another way. I'll put the image in like this. I will um, click here, go to downloads and grab this image. Okay, so now, yeah, this is better. Okay, so now let's try and write this bug so we give them all the information Everything we can think of. Okay, so the, the title of the bug is going to be, uh, what's the name of this keyboard? Magic Keyboard. Um, zoom Reset. So that's uh, CMD plus zero. Zoom reset uh, doesn't work on um, on wireless magic keyboard on wireless Mac magic keyboard. Okay, so what version of VS Code do I have? Um, I'll just I don't know how to tell what version this is. So maybe there's code about, I'll just put this in here. <clears throat> and I'll just say, um, operating system version. So I'm running on uh, 10, 10, 14, six. Uh, 10, 14, six. So Mac OS 10, 14, six. Okay, so uh, steps to reproduce this um, would be zoom the uh, view size. So first of all, this is on a Mac. Um, on a Mac using a wireless uh, magic keyboard. So this is one with um, 
no number pad. Zoom the view size using uh, CMD plus zero. Step two, um, try to reset the zoom to normal uh, using CMD plus, uh, sorry, this would be plus using CMD plus uh, zero and um, then I'm going to say instead of uh, resetting the zoom, the side panel is focused instead, like so. And then it says, I'm going to move this down. Does it happen with, with extensions disabled? Yes. OK, so now I'm going to put in all the information that I found out while I was doing this research. So I'm going to say I have a uh, Mac wireless magic keyboard with uh, no number pad. And I'll say like this one. And in uh, browsers, Chrome, Firefox, etc., using um, CMD plus plus will zoom. CMD plus minus uh, will zoom in, will zoom out. And CMD plus zero will um, reset the zoom to normal. So now in VS Code, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. And now I'm going to give them all the information of what I found. So I did some research. And it looks like the key binding for zoom reset is uh, CMD plus um, num numpad zero. And I'll put a link to the line. So where is this happening? This is happening inside here. So I'll put a link here like this. Um, <clears throat> the binding for CMD plus um, key zero is set here. So this is happening inside of the which file? Um, side part. Did I? I think I got to load that file. Side sidepart.ts and I want to say key zero so it's being set here to this is going to focus this this is the focus sidebar action here in the focus sidebar action so because there is no num number pad on these keyboards, users expect um, CMD plus zero to reset, but this is impossible. Could we rebind the uh, zoom reset action to CMD plus key zero. It's, uh, I would say it's more common, more commonly known than the uh, sidebar focus.
in my opinion. Okay, so we take a look at this and it's gonna look like this. So I'm gonna put in my information. I'm gonna say I'm on this, on a Mac with this keyboard and you do this, it doesn't work. So then I talk about all the different ways that you would zoom in and out in VS Code, it doesn't work. I link to the two places where the code is going wrong and ask them what they, what they would be willing to do. So I'll submit this new issue and see, see what they say. Um, and maybe they'll let me send a PR to fix it, or maybe they'll tell me we're not going to, we're not going to fix this, but I wanted to show you, um, doing this work, we've been able to, you know, we, we've gone fairly slowly here, but in, in about an hour, we've gone from cloning the Visual Studio Code code base to figuring out exactly why a particular piece of code isn't working. And we've been able to send uh, a good bug report with information. If we wanted to, we could, I could send a pull request right now to fix this it, because I already know how I would fix it. But whether they would take that fix or not, I'm not sure. But it wasn't too bad. So if I wasn't recording this, we could have done this probably in 20 minutes. Um, working on a big piece of code like Visual Studio Code, your first instinct is to think this is too hard, this is intimidating, I don't know how anything works. I still have no idea how Visual Studio Code works. There's 1.5 million lines of code. I've only looked at about 15 or 20 lines, but those 15 or 20 lines are all I need in order to fix my bug. So you can get a long way um, when you're trying to figure out how this stuff works by using the debugger, using grep, you know, looking through the code, reading for things, testing things out, setting some breakpoints, etc. Anyway, I wanted to show you this and I have a another walkthrough to fix another bug that you can try in the readings for this week so that you can see what it's like working on a project the size of Visual Studio Code.